Yeah. Well, while he's gone, we're live. Oh, we're live. Yeah. Well, anyway, there's there are extra copies of the paper version of the article I did in the back. Anybody who wants them can have them. Um, it, it's sort of a catalog of the problems, and and it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's I'm I'm convinced that I'm wrong about some of that stuff, but it, it does identify a lot of the issues. So. I'm very uh, sympathetic to your example of the uh, motion to suppress uh, the illegal search and jurors using Google or whatever to, to find out about information that they've been told that they ought not be looking for. Um, it, that does strike me as a real due process problem right? and um, counts against uh, public access to that sort of information. And so I, I start thinking about, well, how can we deal with this? Um, and the first thing that comes to mind is, well, you could do a temporary seal on information like that for the length of the litigation and, you know, try to keep it out of the public eye until it's no longer harmful and then you release it. But that's not going to solve the repeat offender problem <laughs> that you raised, right? And so, um, and, you know, I start spinning through a couple other ideas and eventually what I get to is, look, we have to accept that our system of justice has numerous ways in which it depends on people following the rules. Right? And you, you can't design around the people who are determined to violate those rules. Right? And so maybe that means judges should give even sterner warnings <laughs> to jurors right? and say, and maybe even explain the rationale, right? um, not just say, don't go home and read about this, don't do you know, a cursory prepared statement or something, but try to really, <laughs> in a compelling way, say this is fundamental right, to our system of justice and here's why, and so I'm you know, instructing you in the strongest terms possible right, you know, <laughs> that you are not in, allowed to do this. And maybe it will work and maybe it won't, but it's the, it's the best we can do and we rely on people following the rules in a dozen other ways in our system of justice and so there it is. I agree with you. I think that, I think that the answer is going to, you're going to find the answer in things that are far simpler than we think the answer can be found in. Um, obviously, if you, if you, you know, one good rule is every single, I think one good rule that the judicial conference is now considering is a rule a historian proposed, which was sort of obvious if, if anybody thought about it, which is whenever you file a, uh, whenever you file a motion to seal or whatever court seals a document, right? Um, there ought to be a tick. There ought to be a time limit on it, because there's no there's no information that's so sensitive that it at some point it ceases that it continues to be sensitive forever, right? So, um, you know, a good example would be information that's in, involved in a electronic surveillance. I get a, a T3 order from a court. I'm listening to a drug dealer. Well, the information is is no longer going to be that sensitive once we've tried the case obviously, because at that point it's been disclosed to the person who's most interested in it. Likewise, um, but, but there should never be anything filed where it's under seal forever. Another good example where it's even simpler is maybe sterner warnings with juries would help. One thing that I've done, I try a lot of healthcare fraud cases. And in those healthcare fraud cases, I'm dealing with a lot of medical records because that's just part of the evidence. Um, the patients are, are the victims in many instances. And so we're going to be talking about what happened in the, in the, in, in the, the, court, the, the physician's office. This, you know, a prosecuting physician, that's the subject of, this, of the thing. Well, you know, you can, you can redact everything with a really, really complicated and expensive process, or you have a rule, but you know what works perfectly well? Is you have the judge give the jury an instruction at the beginning of the trial, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we're going to be actually uh, looking at, and, and part of the evidence in this case involves people's health records. You know, I, I think you need to realize that you only want to be using that information for purposes of your, of your, of your um, adjudication here today. Uh, likewise, the same instruction is given to the public who's watching. Legally, it doesn't control anything, but as a practical matter, newspapers, even now, even though they're legally entitled to report the names of rape victims, they don't because social norms take over. So I think that, that the recognition that, 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 that you know, if, if the, the, the norms of who we are as a people can in fact supplement the law in a really important way, and, and that's gonna be an aspect 
of, of information management that, that, that I think we in our litigious world often forget. I think, Brian, your comment uh, brings up, I think something we should have pointed out more explicitly is the best privacy rules change the incentives. Um, I think if you look at, for instance, security breach notification laws, the, the genius of them is they don't tell individuals how to secure data. They simply say, if you mess up and you spill data, um, you're going to pay uh, through this, this disclosure. So it really shapes incentives greatly. I found with the data, in particular with data aggregation companies, they can figure out ways around any rule. No matter how um, careful you are, they find out ways of doing it. And um, they will trick people into providing information, et cetera. Um, changing the incentive model is, is, has got to be part of the solution. Um, I, I would actually second that point. Um, you may ask what helped uh, fix some of the privacy issues in our federal courts, and it really wasn't the New York Times in the, um, article, and it wasn't the Senate investigation. Um, I'm convinced the thing that mattered the most was the judge who fined a lawyer several thousand dollars for filing social security numbers. And word has gotten out in the bar that if you file, at least in that jurisdiction, it's going to cost you a lot of money if you screw up. And I think that makes a real difference that, that we care about that. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a few minutes left, and I really just want to open it up to see if anybody has any closing comments or, or things they want to say about today. We've got about 20 minutes. So um, does anybody have any comments they'd like to make? Uh, Tim Stan. I'd like to say something about the privacy issues. I think more than uh, whether it's a social security number or a driver's license number, it's the fact that it's their name getting out there when they're involved in litigation. So most people have very few documents about themselves online. And maybe even Charles has lots about them. But most <laughs> individual, uh, you know, normal citizens, you know, they're not in the news all the time. They live pretty much private lives. And uh, the courts are one place where you get your name out there along with interesting stories attached to your name which are involved in the middle litigation. And it's extremely uh, confrontational. It's uh, sort of what I was mentioning with the people really. It's something which is often hateful going both ways. Um, and what happens is this information gets out there and pretty soon that's the only thing you find out about this person you search on Google. It has nothing to do, again, whether someone's going to steal their identity or anything else. It's just that this is it because they don't know how to protect their reputation online in any other way. And many people don't even know this information is out there about them. So I think as the courts look through privacy issues, beyond just sort of, you know, here's sort of data aggregation that might be done by you know, Choice Point or some of these other companies, it's how do they look at the stuff that gets out and indexed by Google or on the internet, how does that impact these individuals? Because I can see many people maybe not filing lawsuits uh, for employment cases because they're afraid to have their name attached to uh, uh, an employment discrimination case, even if they're totally, totally legitimate that they do it, just every other employer will hire them. And so how it impacts their choices as well. So that, that was the one thing I wanted to throw out. Nothing, you know, just a different way of sort of looking at privacy, which might be totally open in terms of what the legalities are, but really impacts other people's lives. I just wanted to make a comment. My name is Adriel Hampton. I do a, a podcast about government uh, openness and technology. and. It's kind of how I found out about this movement even before Carl invited me. But I think that one of the most important things of activism of this type is to make sure that everyone knows about it because they have to hear it over and over again to realize what a good idea it is to get primary source materials, building codes, et cetera, online for free. And the way to do that is to, if you're on Facebook, post a status update about being there. If you're part of newsletters or listservs to, to do that, if you uh, go to religious uh, services to tell people about it because people have to hear something over and over to realize how good it is. I mean, part of my advocacy is around I don't want to see it take two or three generations to change because I think that the way we're headed, we're going to crumble under our own weight. So we can make change happen faster, and the way to do it is to talk to people about it. Anybody else? Uh, Roberta, Mr. Berrien, any closing comments? Um, well, thank you everyone, everybody for coming. We'll have video up online probably by this weekend as a rough cut, and then in a, in a month or so we'll have a, a nice edited version of, of this workshop available. So thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
extra copies of a couple of uh, my pamphlets. I'll leave them up in the front. You're welcome to take these. Please, anybody who wants one of these, uh, I don't want to carry them to back. Sorry. <laughs> 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 <laughs>